Today we're going to look at circular motion. Um, so you can probably guess that in circular motion we have an object that's traveling around in a circle. And we're not talking about things traveling in ellipses or ovals or anything like that. We're just going to look at circles. And we're often going to look at something called uniform circular motion. That's a special case where the object is traveling at a constant speed around the circle. It's not speeding up and it's not slowing down. And I'm going to draw four different situations that are all uniform circular motion. First, uh, imagine you take a bagel, you tie it to a string, and then you swing it around your head. Um, and I'm going to draw that from above. Uh, so we got a bagel on a string, swing it around in a circle. Another thing that can travel in a circle is the Earth. Okay, technically it's an ellipse. Let's imagine it's a circle. So the Earth is going around the sun. Let's draw that. Um, let's imagine we take a uh, roll of masking tape and we put it on a table. Then you take a ball and put it into the center. The ball can roll around in the center of that hoop. So let's imagine we do that. And then last of all, let's imagine that we have a car that's driving around in circles in a big parking lot like you're not supposed to. And I'll draw that as you would see it from above. So four cases where an object is traveling in a circle. The bagel, the earth, the ball, and the car. In every case, the object is not speeding up and is not slowing down, but it is changing its velocity. It is changing its velocity. The reason why is that velocity is a vector. Velocity has a direction. So even though each object isn't speeding up and isn't slowing down, it is changing its direction during that motion. And if it's changing the direction that it's traveling, then it's changing its velocity because velocity is a vector. Okay, so if the velocity is changing, then that means it has to be accelerating. And if it's accelerating, then according to Newton's second law, there has to be a net force on the object. Hmm. Okay, so let's ask this. In each case, what force acts on the object to make it travel in a circle? Well, in the case of the bagel on a string, it's the tension force. If that string was not there, it wouldn't travel in a circle. The tension force makes the bagel travel in a circle. For the Earth going around the sun, it's gravitational force. If the gravitational force wasn't there, the Earth wouldn't travel in the circle. For the ball in a hoop, it's the normal force. The normal force of the hoop on the ball causes it to move in a circle. If there were no normal force, it would not travel in a circle. And for the car driving in a circle, that's a little tricky. But think about it this way. What force would you have to remove to make it not move in a circle? Well, if the car started sliding on some ice, so it hit an icy patch, then it would no longer travel in a circle. It would slide in a straight line. So, it's friction. Friction is causing it to travel in a circle. So in every case, there is a force. And in every case, the force that causes it to move in a circle is pointing toward the center of the circular path. We call this kind of force a centripetal force. A centripetal force is a force that acts toward the center of the circular path, and that is the force that makes it move in a circle. And keep in mind, this is not centrifugal, it's centripetal, which comes from Latin and it means center-seeking. Centrifugal is different, we're not going to worry about that, that means center-fleeing. So, okay, in every case, we know that there is a force acting toward the center, and that's the centripetal force. Now, it's also the net force in each of these cases, so that means that we also know the acceleration's direction. If the net force is toward the center, the acceleration is toward the center. And we also know the velocity direction, because the velocity is just the direction that it's moving at each moment. And if I draw those arrows in there, if I draw these vectors, you can see the velocity is always perpendicular to both the centripetal force and the acceleration. In circular motion, the velocity is always perpendicular to the centripetal force and the acceleration. Now. I'm going to take a break from the diagrams and the reasoning, and we're going to look at some equations that you can apply. So the first two I'm going to give you without deriving them. Um, one is that the centripetal acceleration 
is equal to v squared over r, and the other is that the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. And in both of these equations, the v represents speed, and it's technically instantaneous speed, so the speed at one single moment. Um, and then r is the radius of the circular path. The next equation we will derive. So let's think about an object that's traveling in a circle. Um, and then let's, let's think about the speed of it. Well, speed is the distance over the time. Well, if an object travels once around a circle, what distance did it travel? Well, it traveled the circumference. That's the distance around a circle, which is 2 pi r. And the time that it takes to go around once, we are going to define as a period. And it's represented with a capital T. So the period capital T is the time that it takes to go around a circle once. The unit is seconds, it's a scalar. So the speed is equal to 2 pi r over t. We can put that into the acceleration equation, and if we do that and do a little bit of algebra, we come up with this. The acceleration is equal to v squared over r, and it's also equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. All right, last thing we're going to look at is called angular speed or rotational speed, and it is defined as the ratio of the angle that you've gone through divided by the time that it takes. So it's, let me say that again. It's the ratio of the angle that you pass through to the time that it takes to pass through that angle. And it's supposed to be an analogy to speed. Um, speed is the ratio of the distance you travel to the time that it takes. Here we're looking at the angle that you've traveled through to the time that it takes. So we usually represent the angular speed with the Greek letter lowercase omega, which looks like a curvy W. Um, so we can say that omega is equal to delta theta, that's the angle you traveled through, divided by the time that it took. Time that it took, delta T. If you remember back to geometry, it's okay if you don't, but it turns out that the distance that you travel around a circle is equal to r times the angle that you travel. So we can write down an equation for the speed. The speed is equal to the distance that you travel around the circle, which is r times delta theta, divided by the time that it takes, delta t. And we can move the things around a little bit, and we can see that the speed of an object in circular motion is equal to the angular speed times r. And we can use that, we can put it into the circular motion equation, or excuse me, circular force, centripetal force equation. So the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r, and that's equal to m omega squared times r.